Well, I'm excited to be with you this morning. Uh, usually I'm the one playing the music. And so I'm excited to be on a, a different side this morning. Um, it was great to sing with you all this morning. and I enjoyed that a lot. My name is Joseph Hughes, for those of you who don't know me. And uh, I don't do this very often. I don't preach very often. And if I were trying to sell you something, that might be a problem. Or if I was trying to entertain you, that might be a problem. Or if I was trying to emotionally manipulate you, that would definitely be a problem. But I'm not. I'm here to bring you God's word. I'm here to get out of the way of the text and let the text do the work. So um, <clears throat> let me see if I got my document downloaded onto my kid's tablet right. And then uh, we'll get started. Oh, it's there. All right. This morning, if you were hoping to get Cody preaching to you from the book of Job, then I'm sorry to disappoint you. You get the, the uh, backup team. You get the JV squad. Instead, we're going to be preaching on the armor of God. We're going to be continuing uh, our series on the armor of God. And uh, Chris Morris kicked us off with the belt of truth, and John Wood preached to us from the uh, breastplate of righteousness, and this morning we're going to be talking about the shoes of peace which you can find in Ephesians 6. So go ahead and turn to Ephesians 6. We'll be there together. And uh, while you're turning there, let me set the tone for this morning by telling you about my life in high school. <clears throat> when I was in high school, I played a lot of volleyball, like a lot of volleyball. And I love volleyball to this day. There was one particular year in high school where I was playing on three different teams at the same time. And I was coaching a fourth team, a middle school girls volleyball team, which was a trip, let me tell you. That's not the story for this morning. Uh, the story is about a different team. I was on a club team with one of other kid from my high school and then several other kids from uh, the surrounding area. This is like the best of the best in my area. And we played teams from Canada. We went to tournaments in other states. This, this, was, uh, this was a pretty high caliber team. And very quickly, my dad realized that all the other kids on the team were better than I was. And he also realized very quickly that they all had better equipment than I did. And so he took me to Payless Shoe Source, and he found a pair of Mizuno sneakers that were on sale, and he bought me some volleyball shoes. And I tried to persuade him not to. I said, Dad, I don't need volleyball shoes. I've been playing this game for five years. I've never used volleyball shoes. I don't need these, but he bought them anyway. And I'm so glad he did, because when I put those sneakers on, in practice for the very first time. I felt like I could jump higher. The shoes were very light. I felt like I could turn faster. They had great traction. They really amplified my game, and I'm so glad my dad bought them for me. And to this day, any time I play volleyball, I bring my Mizuno sneakers on, and when I get to the gym, I put them on, and then I'm ready. I'm ready to play volleyball. And this morning, Paul wants to teach us about a different kind of shoes, shoes not for volleyball, shoes for something else, and these shoes make us ready. So let's read about that together. We'll take the whole armor of God section, and then we'll zoom in to just the shoes. Paul starts in chapter 6 of Ephesians in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. All four of those phrases are just the same thing. They're talking about the devil and his minions, the bad guys <clears throat> in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which was, is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. So there you go. There's the armor of God section. And what Paul's doing here is he's basically saying, look, Ephesian church, you got enemies, but they're not people. Your enemies are spiritual enemies. So if you, need, if you have spiritual enemies, you need spiritual armor to protect you against the attack of your spiritual enemies. And he lists six different pieces of armor 
uh, shoes of peace, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, the works. Each one of these things helps protect us from the attacks of the devil. We already heard two sermons, uh, belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness. Today we're going to talk about the shoes of peace, so let's read that verse again in verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So what we find is they're not actually shoes of peace, they're shoes of readiness, shoes of readiness, and they're readiness given by the gospel of peace. So here's where we're going to go for the rest of the sermon. We're going to talk about readiness, and we're going to talk about the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace, that phrase, is going to take us back to Ephesians 2, and the idea of readiness we'll see here in chapter 6, but we'll also see that in Isaiah chapter 52. Fair enough? All right. Let's talk about that idea of readiness first. Paul wants us to be ready. He wants us to put on shoes so we're ready, and that readiness comes from the gospel of peace. But what are we supposed to be ready for? What are we supposed to be ready for? It kind of helps you to know how to get ready if you know what to get ready for. So there's two answers. There's an offensive answer and a defensive answer. There's a very clear defensive answer in Ephesians 6. Paul's saying, stand firm. He uses that word stand a whole bunch of times. Stand firm. You're going to be attacked. Put in the armor so you can stand firm, so you don't move. Don't move on from the gospel. Don't leave the gospel. That's what Paul's doing. At the end of his letter, each one of these pieces of armor, they're just different facets of the gospel. Sometimes we talk about the gospel as if it's a diamond, and you can look at it from different angles. It's the same thing. You can just see it from different angles, and it looks slightly different from different angles, and that's what Paul's doing here. He's got six, six different angles, lenses, to view the gospel through. And Paul is saying, put on the gospel. Wear the gospel. Don't forget the gospel. Don't move on from the gospel. He spent five and a half chapters talking to the Ephesian church about various things, but he says, this is what I want to end with. This is what I want to close with. Don't move on from the gospel. The gospel protects you. He's not talking to people outside the church. He's talking to people inside the church. Paul is telling the people inside the church, you need the gospel. I need the gospel. We need the gospel. The gospel is not only what saves us, but it's what protects us. It's what keeps us safe. That's the defensive answer, but there's an offensive answer as well. And the offensive answer, you may see in your cross-references, if you look carefully and your Bible has cross-references, you may see a cross-reference to Isaiah 52, verse 7. And people have made those cross-references, scholars have made those cross-references because there's a whole bunch of different references in the Armor of God section to various parts of Isaiah. And uh, Chris Morris actually helped me see this in his sermon. He talked that the armor of God is called the armor of God because God wears it in Isaiah. And you can go listen to his sermon and hear about other places on Isaiah that Paul's alluding to. But today, I want to look at the, the feet aspect, the shoes aspect, and we're going to go to Isaiah 52, verse 7, which we read in the call to worship this morning. If you want to, you can turn there but we're going to be coming right back to Ephesians quickly, so um, you, you're welcome to just listen as I read this. Isaiah 52, verse 7 says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. So Isaiah is giving us a picture of someone with beautiful feet, why are they beautiful? Because they're climbing a mountain. They're climbing a mountain with good news of peace. And that phrase, good news, and the phrase gospel, gospel means good news. So those are equivalent phrases. And there's peace in the text. There's feet in the text. This is what's going through Paul's mind. He's drawing upon images in the Old Testament. And Paul wants us to have an offensive answer to what are we supposed to be ready for. We're supposed to be ready to climb mountains. But where are we supposed to go? What mountains are we supposed to climb? Well, the messenger here is going to a place called Zion, and Zion's the name of a hill, and the hill is, this, is the hill that the city of Jerusalem was built on. So this is a messenger coming back home. This is a messenger bringing the gospel to God's people. This is a messenger doing the same thing that Paul's doing, bringing the gospel 
to God's people inside the church. And you might say to me, well, aren't we supposed to preach the gospel to people outside the church? And yes, and if you keep reading in Isaiah, you'll get there too. We're supposed to preach the gospel to all the nations, and that's us. We're all the nations. But it starts with bringing the message back home. It starts with bringing the message to God's people. Paul this morning, Paul wants you to put on your shoes, your gospel shoes, so you can climb mountains to bring the gospel to people inside this church because they need the gospel. Paul wants your life to be transformed, and then because your life is transformed, he wants you to bring the message that transformed your life to other people. <clears throat> That's it. That's the whole sermon this morning. That's it. That's what we're trying to get to. So with the time we have left, we're going to go back to Ephesians, and we're going to pick up on that phrase, the gospel of peace, which is a little bit of an unusual way to describe the gospel. It's, it's a particular lens that Paul uses to look into the gospel, <clears throat> that phrase gospel of peace. And I think if you were reading through the book of Ephesians or listening to someone read to you the book of Ephesians in its entirety from chapter 1, when you get to the end of chapter 6, and Paul uses that phrase gospel of peace, it would remind you of something that he had already talked about in Ephesians 2. So that's where we're going to go. And in Ephesians 2, what Paul does is he builds an argument in three layers. He starts with, like, the bottom layer, like you would build a cake. Well, okay, let's be honest. Like, you would pay somebody to build a cake, right? He starts with the bottom layer, <clears throat> and he doesn't start with the bad news. He starts with the good news. <clears throat> I flipped that. I said that wrong. It starts with the bad news. And we're going to call that layer of the cake. We're going to call that peace with Satan. And then he builds another layer on top of that. We're going to call that layer peace with God. And then finally, he gets to that third layer. That's the layer he's referencing in Ephesians 6. But we've got we to gotta start where Paul starts. And that third layer is going to be peace with others. Peace with Satan, peace with God, peace with others. <laughs> Let's do it. Read with me in Ephesians 2, verse 1. We'll take the first three verses. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. God's not the only one with a wonderful plan for your life. Satan has a wonderful plan for your life, and he makes you an offer you can't refuse. Here's what Satan offers you. He says, if you make peace with me, I will give you whatever you want. Anything that comes into your mind, you can have that. Anything that comes into your heart, you can go get that. Anything and everything, whatever you can dream up, you can have it. You say, okay, Satan, all right, it's not too bad. Anything? What else you got for me? Satan says, you can be like everyone else. Just play follow the leader. You don't have to be weird or strange. You don't have to be different. You don't have to have people hating you for what you believe. You can be just like everyone else. You're like, well, oh, that doesn't really sound too bad either. What else you got? Satan says, all I want. Look, all I want is for you just to be the way that you used to be. I wish things just were the way they used to be. Why can't you be like you were before you got saved? And if we're honest, there are aspects of that pitch, that appeal, that are very compelling. Satan doesn't want you to put on climbing shoes. Satan wants you to put your feet up in an easy chair and put slippers on. That's what Satan offers you this morning. But here's the problem. What Satan calls freedom do whatever you want. The Bible calls slavery. And here's how Satan tricks us, because he says, do whatever you want. And then you produce your own illicit desires, and he helps you produce evil desires. And then as soon as you give in to that desire, all of a sudden, you get new desires. And whereas you were dissatisfied this much, now all of a sudden you're more dissatisfied and then you give in a little bit more, and then you get new desires, and then you give in more and more and more until the point where you're running headlong down a path you never thought you'd be heading down, and your life 
is completely different than what you thought it would be. <clears throat> Satan likes, is like a toxic boyfriend who keeps dragging you back into the toxic things that used to hold you captive by. And here's what Satan's end game is. Satan wants you to be dead in your sins. He wants you to be children of wrath. He wants you to give up on your faith and give up on Christ. He wants you to be exactly the way that Job's wife counseled him to be. He wants you to curse God and die. And this is our story, brothers and sisters. This is our story. Before Christ saved us, this is who we were. We were dead in our sins. We were children of wrath. But God made us alive. And that's where Paul goes next. And we're going to move into the second tier of our argument here. Second tier, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying here is that we were dead. We were dead. We couldn't save ourselves. We were dead. But God made us alive. God takes the primary action here. We were dead, but God made us alive. And he made us alive through the gospel, through Christ's death, through grace. And that grace comes to us as a gift. But Satan doesn't want us to believe that. Satan doesn't want you to believe you were really dead. He wants you to believe you were mostly dead, but you clawed your way to the gospel and how great you are. Satan doesn't want you to believe that it's a gift. Satan wants you to believe that you can earn it, that if you put your shoes on good enough, then you can earn your salvation. Well, not all of it, but just a tiny little piece of it. You can earn part of it, because if you can earn it, then you have something to boast about. You have something to brag about. You can be better than me. You can be better than someone else. I can be better than you if we can earn it. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that we're saved by grace. We're only saved by grace. You can't earn your salvation. God takes the primary action here, and he gives us new desires that compete with our old desires. He doesn't take away our old desires immediately, but he gives us new desires. We desire to love other people. We desire to follow God's rules. The gospel is supposed to transform our lives. This gospel is supposed to matter to us. The gospel is supposed to be like an anchor for your soul. It's supposed to be like a fortress that you can hide in. The gospel is supposed to be like a rock that you can stand on. Paul tells the Philippian church that the grace of God, the peace of God, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Does the gospel guard your mind? Does the gospel guard your heart? That's what the gospel is supposed to do. But too often, instead of the gospel being like a rock that we stand on in the midst of a chaotic and anxious world, too often it's the anxiety and it's the chaos that reigns in our heart. And that's one of Satan's oldest tricks. It's one of his oldest lies. He knows he can't get you to believe that the gospel's false, but he doesn't have to. All he has to do is get you to believe that the gospel's true, but... It's not that important. Yeah, the gospel's true, but I wonder what's new on Netflix. Yeah, the gospel's, oh man, I, I just can't decide whether strawberry or chocolate is my favorite ice cream. All Satan has to do is distract you, and then the gospel has no power in your life. The problem is there's only two options. Either we're be, being transformed by the gospel, or we're being transformed by the gospel of Satan. We're being transformed by this world. That's not what Paul wants, and that's not what God wants. God wants us to put on our shoes so that we're ready to stand against the schemes of the devil. So what that means is don't settle for a boring gospel. Don't settle for a boring Jesus. Don't settle for a cookie-cutter Jesus. Dig into Scripture Read scripture. Be transformed in your mind. That's what it means to put on the armor of God. It's not physical armor. It's not armor you can just go to a Renaissance fair and pick up and just strap on your body. This is spiritual armor 
And the way to put on spiritual armor is through the mind. And advertising companies know this. That's why they spend billions of dollars to get your attention, because what we know and what we think about is what we love. So if you want to love the gospel, you need to think about the gospel. You need to read the gospel, meditate on the gospel. You need to discuss the gospel. You need to sing the gospel. You need to pray the gospel. You need to sit under teaching about the gospel. Don't settle for a boring gospel. So that's the second layer of Paul's argument, the second layer of Paul's cake. And we haven't gotten to the peace yet. Nowhere in anywhere in Ephesians 2, in the first 10 verses, does Paul use the word peace. But we're going to get there. That's why we're here. So let's play a game. Let's read the rest of Ephesians 2, and we'll play a game. It's called Spot the Peace. Let's do it. Verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So what Paul's doing here is continuing his argument, you were dead, but God made you alive. He says, zoom out, think bigger. You're not the only one that God made alive. God made a lot of people alive. And now, through Christ, you share something in common that transcends everything else that might threaten to separate you. Paul says, the things that used to divide us, those didn't go away. They're still there. But now what we share in Christ is more important than those things. And that's where the concept of peace for Paul really kicks in at a high gear. And I don't know if you noticed verse 17, but that's, I think, the verse that he's referencing in Ephesians 6. Let me find that again, and then we'll read it. And he came and preached he meaning Jesus. And Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. There's two different pronouns here because what Paul's doing is he's addressing one group of people and he's talking about a different group of people. And that group of people is the Jews. And the people he's addressing he's referring to as Gentiles because Gentile is just a term for anyone who's not a Jew. And there would have been huge dividing walls of hostility between Gentiles and Jews in the early church. Because before Christ, if you wanted to come to God, there were huge cultural and religious barriers to you becoming saved. If you wanted to know God before Christ, you had to become a Jew. You had to follow all of the laws and there are a lot of laws in the Old Testament. You had to be circumcised if you were a man without anesthesia, and that was just the tip of the issue. There were also lots of dietary laws. You had to give up ham and bacon and shellfish. There were rites of purification you had to follow. Pretty much if any bodily fluid came out of you at some point, there might have been a rite of purification for you to follow. And Even then, as a Gentile, there were places in the temple that you were not allowed to go because there was separation between you and God's people. But now in Christ Jesus, 
we have something better than the law. We have Christ, and Christ perfectly fulfilled the law on our behalf. And when we come to write to Christ, we get Christ's righteousness. And you can listen to John's sermon. There's a whole sermon on that. And Christ died for us as well. And his perfect sacrifice once for all means that we don't have to carry animals to the temple anymore and have somebody else kill them for us to atone for our sins. <clears throat> the gospel of peace is this. It's that when God reconciles us through Christ, we go from being aliens to being citizens. And no aliens doesn't mean like you're from another planet. What Paul means here is he means aliens, as in people from other countries. You go from being aliens to citizens. You go from being strangers to members of the same household. You go from being far off to brought near. <clears throat> when your life is transformed by the gospel, it changes the way you see yourself. No longer do you see yourself as a person from a foreign country in a strange land, but you see yourself as a citizen with all the saints. When your life is transformed by the gospel, it changes the way you see others. No longer do you see them as strangers, but you see them as family, as members of God's household. When your life is transformed by the gospel, it makes you ready to climb mountains. And there are mountains in this church. There are mountains in the Journey Church. And they're not mountains that divide Jews and Gentiles. Pretty much we're all Gentiles. They're not mountains, they're not dividing walls of hostility, but they're mountains between people who maybe should know one another, but just don't know each other very well. We don't know, very one, we don't know one another very well, and I think if you take a look around this room this morning, even though a lot of us are gone because it's the summer, and that's okay, if you take a look around this room, I think what you'll see is a fair number of strangers and aliens and far less family members. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why that is. I truly don't. But here's what I do know. I get up here and I lead music just about every Sunday and I see a lot of people that I don't know. And some of you, I don't even know your name. I don't know your story. I don't know where you're at in your journey. I may have introduced myself to you or you may have introduced yourself to me and I just, I don't remember you. <clears throat> some of you I know, I haven't talked to you for a while. And if I don't know you, that may not be your fault. And it may not be my fault either. Maybe it's our fault. Maybe it's a cultural problem. Maybe it's part of the culture. Maybe it's part of our DNA here at The Journey. We don't know one another very well. It's not normal to go to church with strangers and aliens. Or maybe it is, I don't know. Maybe that's normal. But Paul says it shouldn't be normal. It shouldn't be normal. Paul also says we're being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We're a house. We're bricks in a house. And Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. But when I think about bricks in a house, when I think about the journey, what I think about is the way that my son Judah used to build Legos when he was four years old. When he was four years old, he'd take those square Legos, the big ones, not the, uh, not the little Legos, and he'd stack a column on top of each other. And each one of those blocks was connected this way, and he'd slap that down, and then he'd make another column and put that down until he had a whole row of columns, and that was his wall for his house. The problem was there was huge cracks running up and down each one of those columns, huge cracks in the walls. And I think the journey can be like that. I think there's cracks in the fabric of our relationships. We all know somebody, we're all connected to somebody, but how do, deep do those relationships go? And that's, that's what you might say to me. You might say, well, I do know people here. Okay, that's good. How deep do those relationships go? Are those relationships built on the Bible? Are they built on the Scripture? Are they built on prayer and fellowship? Or are they just relationships? And you might say, uh, all right, well, I know a lot of people here. But are you making new friends? Are you bringing new people into your circles? Do you have your shoes on? Are you moving towards people? Or are you just keeping with the same friends that you've had for a long time? Are you making room for new people in your life? Do you even recognize when there's new people that come here? 
I struggle with that. I struggle to recognize when people are new. I can't tell you how many times I've introduced myself to someone that I thought was new and they've been coming here for months. I can't tell you how many new people I've talked to that say the same thing that I said when I came here six years ago, and that's like, so hard to meet people in the journey. It's so hard to make friends here. Why is that? It's not how Christ says it should be. That's not how Paul says it should be. And you might say to me, yeah, but I can't know everyone here, and you're right. You can't know everyone. The point is, what shoes are you wearing? Are you moving towards people, or do you have your slippers on? You might say to me, but I don't have time. I don't have time to make friends here. I'm a busy person, and we're all busy, right? And now maybe we're getting to the heart of the issue. I don't know. We're all busy, and sometimes busyness comes in seasons, and look, okay, let's not be a church that judges people who are busy, okay? That's not what we're trying to do here. But think about your own life, and think about yourself. Why are you busy? Do you need to be making time for God's people? Maybe some of you just need to strategize better. Maybe some of you need to make structural changes in your life so that you can have time to make friends in the journey, so that you can have, have time to climb mountains to bring the gospel to people. Maybe you're busy because of something that you, a choice that you made and you didn't realize how busy you were going to be. <clears throat> Business comes in seasons. I've had lots of busy seasons in my life. Look, I'm not here to judge you, okay? That's Satan's job. Satan's job is to accuse you before the Father, and I'm not here to do that. And you might say to me, but you don't know what it would cost me to make time for fellowship here. And for a lot of you, I don't know, because I don't know you, and I don't know your story, and I don't know your journey. I don't know if coming to church on Sunday morning is progress for you. I don't know if you're crawling forward in your journey. I don't know where you're at. That's part of the problem. I'm not here to judge you either. <clears throat> and I also want to remind you of something, that we're saved by grace, right? We're saved by grace. It doesn't matter how many people you know or how many times you've told someone the gospel. It doesn't matter how much time you make for people. That's not what saves us. We're saved by grace through faith. But at the same time, that grace is not merely divine leniency. Grace is a power at work to change your life. And if you're not being transformed by the gospel of grace, then you're being transformed by Satan's gospel. The reason I'm here this morning, the reason I made time to preach to you this morning is not because I get paid for this and I don't get paid much, and it's not because I got tired of playing music for you. The reason I'm here is because my life has been transformed by the gospel. I'm here to preach to you the same gospel that's changed my life. It cost me to make time for this this morning. It cost my wife time so that she could free me up so that I could practice this sermon. And we don't regret that at all. We love to do that because we have been transformed by the gospel. We've been changed by the gospel. I love the gospel and I love my Savior and I wish that you knew him the way that I do. And if you make time for me, I'll bring that gospel to you as well. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that salvation is by grace. I thank you for saving me, and I thank you for saving many people here this morning. And I pray that you would be glorified in this church, and I pray that you would be honored by the sacrifices that we make in order to love one another and bring the gospel to one another in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm -hmm.